So my impression is that this anthropic principle, uh, the reaction, my reaction at least, and probably Professor Lasota as well, uh, like Paul Gordon reacted to Hilbert's proof about invariants. That there is not mathematics, but theology. So anthropic principle is not physics, but rather theology. Do you agree? Your, your statement is it's not physics, but is but is what was it? The theology. Theology. Okay. Um, that was indeed the reaction in the early days but of, of some physicists, uh, because there were indeed some explicitly theological explanations of fine tuning. Some people inferred that if there was fine tuning of the constants there must have been a fine tuner, and therefore people said, some people said, therefore this is tantamount to invoking God. Now most physicists, of course, do not want to invoke God. One is trying to uh, explain the laws of nature without invoking any, anything supernatural. And I think that is why people, physicists, had a great antipathy in the early days. And, I, and I, in my talk, I said there were three explanations. There was the multiverse, there was consciousness collapsing the wave function, and there was theology. Now, <clears throat> I would say, now, I have to say, uh, I have nothing against God. I, I, I mean, I think there's a, a false dichotomy. People say, well, you've either got God or you've got the multiverse. Uh, and to me, th that is a false dichotomy, because if you want to believe in God, uh, I see no reason why God couldn't create a multiverse. So if you want to believe in God, that's to do with... The evidence for God doesn't come from science, I would say. The evidence for God comes from inside. So personally, I, I, I don't see that this battle between God and, and, and science as, as being valid. I mean, obviously, sociologically, there is a tension between God and science, but I don't think it's necessary. I think that if you want to believe in God, you can. I don't see that as being inconsistent with science. But what I am arguing is that these anthropic tunings, if they can have a physical explanation, that, then that is preferable to having an explanation which invokes God, because physics wants to explain as much as possible. So then the question is, does one count the multiverse as proper physics? Now, some people argue that it's really just as mysterious as God, and therefore the, the multiverse itself can be regarded as, as theology. I, I, I don't take that view. Because the point is that the multiverse is predicted by many theories of physics. And we've talked a few of them. We've talked about, we've talked about M theory uh, and, and, and the, the string landscape. But that may not be right, but it's one particular version. There's also the many worlds interpretation associated with Everett Wheeler's interpretation of quantum theory but there are also all sorts of concepts in cosmology where the many worlds arises. And we talked about inflation, but even if you don't believe in eternal inflation, there, is, uh, there are different versions of, of cosmology you know, which will produce the multiverse. So I take the view that the multiverse is, it comes out of conventional physics. And in that sense, uh, I regard it as physical rather than theological. However, there are many people who argue that the multiverse is not proper physics because we don't have any observational evidence for it. Uh, George Ellis, for example, whose name was mentioned by both myself and John Pierre, he, is a, he has argued that the multiverse is not proper physics because it, doesn't, it, it's, it cannot be confirmed empirically. It can, it can explain anything and cannot be disproved. Now, the, even George isn't saying it's 
theology. George Ellis is saying it's philosophy. And he's making a distinction between physics and philosophy. So George is not saying necessarily the multiverse doesn't exist. He's simply saying it's not part of physics. Now, my own view is that at the moment it's not part of physics because we don't, in, in a certain sense, because we don't have direct evidence for the multiverse. We can't see the other universes. Okay? And, and in that sense, you might say it's not, it's not proper science because if you can't observe something, how can it be science? But the problem is that in physics, there are lots of things you can't see, but you still believe in them. You can't see inside a black hole, but we still, most physicists believe models of the inside of a black hole. We can't see quarks. We can't see free quarks, but we still believe that there can be, we still believe the model which predicts the free quarks. So the fact that you can't see the multiverse does not necessarily mean it's wrong. It may still be predicted by a theory of physics. You don't have to say that every aspect of a theory can be confirmed. So that's my Maybe someone's disagreeing with me. But, uh, but uh, so the point is that you, my argument is that there are physical theories which do predict the multiverse, such as M theory. But then people say, well, maybe M theory isn't proper uh, physics either. Maybe M theory is just mathematics. And the problem, so my solution, I'm talking rather at length about this, but my personal view is that the idea of a multiverse at present is not proper, it's not even proper cosmology. It's on the border of cosmology and, and philosophy. It's what I call metacosmology. I think I used the word metacosmology in my slide. But the point of saying it's metacosmology is that at the moment we don't have direct evidence. But I still think in principle you may get direct evidence for the multiverse and indeed for M theory. It's just that we don't have it at the moment. And the whole history of cosmology has been a bit like that. You have the theory. In the, whole, in the old days, all of cosmology was rejected as philosophy uh, because we didn't have evidence for it. But the point is we now have the evidence. So what was, if you like, a philosophical speculation, which what was metacosmology, has now become cosmology. So the, the whole history of cosmology is this shift of this boundary between metacosmology and cosmology. And to me, the multiverse is just the latest historical example of that. We don't yet have the data to confirm the multiverse, and therefore it's in this, in this state of being on the boundary of physics and metaphysics, if you like. Um, but I, I don't see in principle why there shouldn't be eventually evidence for, for this, which would make it a proper physical theory. So this is a rather long answer. What I'm saying is I, 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 I don't sympathize with the view that it's theology, but the view that it's philosophy rather than physics, I, I find is much more, uh, you can argue that much more strongly. And then I simply say, well, there's always a boundary between physics and philosophy. And if we late, wait long enough, I think we may get evidence, but I don't know where, whether it will be in my lifetime. In the meantime, the main evidence is the fine tunings. Because the question is, how are you going to explain the fine tunings? If, the, if our final physics doesn't explain the fine tunings, how are you going to explain them? And, and the multiverse is, is just the currently, really, the only explanation people have proposed, if you believe in the tunings. And the people who don't believe in the tunings, who say it's a coincidence, of course, they, they don't need it. But for those of us who believe there is a problem, that there is, there is a tuning problem, to me, the multiverse just seems the best option, but it's simply not the one which uh, uh, involves uh, empirical evidence apart from the tuning itself. So I've spoken at great length. I must pass over to you both. Yes, do you, Professor Asata, do you have anything to to add about the methodologi methodological status of, of atomic principle, whether it's more theology, more philosophy, maybe some, some maybe draws from science, but it's not science proper. 
Yes. Yeah, so, so the question, the question was, the question was about the methodological status of anthropic reasoning, whether it's uh, it's a science proper or maybe it's more theological in nature, metaphorically speaking. Yeah, I, you know, it's. I would like to mention another example. You know, better to take the, to uh, produ produce examples who answer such questions because I, I limited myself to the classical, uh, almost classical anthropic questions. But there is a question uh, that nobody, not, not, very, not many people realize is time. We have time, what's the origin of time? Uh, and of course it's difficult to imagine a universe without time and time, you know, we, we are wasting a lot of time. And, but it appears that you can, that time, the time can be emergent. You can, it's speculative, but you can construct a physical theory, microscopic theory, and then with a, okay, it's, you're adding, they are adding a, uh, a scalar field. Because it's <laughs> how you do physics nowadays, you add a scalar field, which is called the clock field. And then the time is emerging. So you have the basic structure, there is no time in physics. It's a, it's a speculation, but of course it's, it's a very interesting speculation because then you say there's probably no uh, singularity, it's simply there is no more time there because, because this, this clock, clock field is different in patches and it's, it's very speculative, but, but it shows that the, there is a question where, it come, where the time uh, comes from and I asked the author, um, one of them is Jean-Philippe Uzon, I said that maybe the answer is anthropic. Can you have observers without time? He didn't answer, <laughs> but uh, I can imagine the answer would be uh, the time is because without, without time there will be no, uh, no, no observers. And I mean, you can, you can have many questions answered this way, but of course it doesn't answer the question, for example, about the very shaky status of time in quantum mechanics. It's, uh, it's well known there is a problem, the, the special coordinates, they are presented by operators, but time is not. And it's not clear why. It, in, in classical relativity theory, it's, time is on the same status, the same status as the, as the, as the space uh, coordinates, but not in quantum mechanics. And this is a, so of course, the answer that why uh, the time has this particular uh, function in quantum mechanics, the answer would be because uh, if not the Heisenberg would not exist, it's maybe not an answer. C can I follow, can I f follow up on yep. Jean-Pierre's remark? Because I'm so glad he's mentioned the problem of time because the time is another problem which I would say is on the border of physics and philosophy. It's obviously tremendously relevant for physics, but also it's, it's a, a tremendously relevant for philosophy. And, and, I, and I think it's connected. I, I'm just pointing out that there are quite a number of problems which are on the border of physics and philosophy, and the anthropic principle is, is just one. But why I think the problem of time is particularly relevant is because although physics understands many aspects of, of time, especially since Einstein's theory of space-time, for example, and, and, and fresh insights that come from quantum theory, and, and from thermodynamics and things like that, the one problem we don't understand is, is in a sense a philosophical problem, and that is the question of the passage of time, which is, of course, a crucial feature of consciousness. There is no description of the passage of time within ordinary relativity, because in ordinary, in ordinary special relativity theory, that you have the block universe with past, present, and future coexist. So there is no passage of time within relativity theory. And yet we all know that consciousness does involve a passage of time. And so it's, it's clear that if you want to exp 
explain consciousness, you have to go beyond the normal description of physics which you get from relativity theory. Well, of course, we know we have to go beyond relativity theory because of quantum theory. But I would say that even quantum theory does not give you a full description of the passage of time. On the other hand, I think it is reasonable to say that when we have our final theory of physics, which is going to marry up relativity and quantum theory, that it may be that that theory is going to throw insights into the nature of the passage of time. In other words, into the nature of consciousness. So I, I think that the... You remember when I drew my diagram of the, of the cosmic Euroboros, I said you've got your final theory of physics which is going to marry up quantum theory and relativity theory. And I think the solution to the anthropic principle is, is also and is going to tie up to the question of how you get consciousness into physics and that it's all going to be in that final theory. But of course, it's entire speculation and so... That the word, you know, consciousness is, is, is almost as taboo in physics in, the, in some ways as, as the word anthropic, but it's now becoming respectable. But I do think the problem of the anthropic principle, the role of the observer, and the problem of consciousness, the passage of time, I think they're connected. So that's why I was so interested in your remark, Jean-Pierre. Oh, sorry, two other slides. Uh, because you 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 talked about consciousness, and I I think I would like to join you here uh, uh, because this is a very interesting question. It is, I think, treated in a very sort of offhand way, and uh, pe people don't like physicists don't like even talk about it. But uh, so oh no, okay, no, no, I want not this one. <laughs> No, 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 this, yeah, well, oh, oh, there is one thing, which is, it is this, usually in this discussion, there's this extreme reductionist. This is a, 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 a figure from an article by, by Tegmark uh, from 2003, and he shows the, the structure of science. Everything is, can be reduced, in fact, to physics. So, uh, and sociology, psychology, so I, I even added, you know, music, poetry, religion, painting. I think that I delimited by, by, by this red, uh, red uh, border the, the domain that I don't believe is true. They cannot be reduced to physics. Clearly, uh, consciousness, it's, okay, there are people who claim you can that uh, everything, can be, everything can reduce maybe even to quantum mechanics, but there is something also in, uh, I think, behind this anthropic reasoning, treating that if you solve the physics problem, you will solve all the problems, including consciousness, and uh, including the origin of life, and I think this is, maybe it's true, but it is, I don't believe it is true, I, I am convinced by Arguments, for example, by Tom Nagel, uh, that consciousness cannot be reduced to physics, chemistry, or whatever. But when the question is asked about the fine tuning, I think behind the mind of many people, not your, but you are an exception, <laughs> is that everything is, is this super reduction. You, basically, if you have the theory of everything, you will have the theory really of everything. You can even be, can be described by some e equations of our discussion. And I think this is simply, mm. put it in a simple English, crap. Mm. So I know we're talking, uh, having a dialogue, but can I respond even sure, more of course, to that? Yes, I mean, yes. I have I'm so glad you've shown that diagram because I have to say, I am not a reductionist. I mean, obviously, we've all got our philosophical pictures. I don't like that diagram because I don't like to think that you can reduce poetry and painting and religion to physics. So um, I think I'm agreeing with you in that sense. I, I am not a reductionist. 
However, the question of consciousness is really interesting because um, most physicists would believe, I mean, most scientists, 99% of philosophers would believe that consciousness is produced by the brain. So they would take the reductionist perspective, which means that, first of all, materialism, everything is matter, and, and that consciousness is produced by the brain. And you might then go on to say, well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God either. Um, I, I don't share that view because I don't think everything can be produced to... I, I don't, that's why I find the phrase theory of everything. I even, I think, had the phrase theory of everything on one of my slides. I find that so pretentious because it's clearly only a theory of particle physics. It's not a theory of my experience, and it's not a theory of consciousness. So to me, the phrase theory of everything is really not a theory of everything at all. It's just a theory of particle physics. But then the question is, since consciousness is so important in the universe, can physics in some sense expand to accommodate it? Now, if I like to think, we heard a lot about paradigm shifts over the last few days, I like to think that there may be an expansion of some form of physics which may be able to accommodate consciousness, but it will go well beyond relativity theory. It will go well beyond quantum theory. And, and you might want to call it physics. But the point is it may have some link with physics. And when I talked about consciousness and the passage of time, I'm saying that cannot be explained by normal current physics. But that doesn't mean that in some sense there might not be some expanded physics, which is not reductionist, which may be able to describe uh, both consciousness uh, and indeed, because of that, these sort of anthropic fine tunings. Now, whether you call that final theory of physics philosophy or, or some extended theory of physics is ambiguous, because, uh, it's, but it's not, it's not reductionist in terms of what we currently mean by physics. So I, but, and, you, and John Paul's quite correct. Most physicists don't like talking about consciousness, but not because they don't believe in it, but simply because they believe that consciousness is, that physics is really describing the, the third person perspective and not the first person perspective. Um, but ironically, I would say now, consciousness is a relatively respectable word in physics. Uh, yeah. be, because yeah. because of the quantum theory, because of developments of if cognitive uh, in neuroscience and in cognitive intelligence and, and uh, uh, you know AI and things like this, consciousness people can now talk about it. There's even a meeting going on in Sicily at the moment about the, uh, called the, the science of consciousness going on right now. It's actually respectable. So. I would say the C word is no longer taboo, even though the A word is still a little bit taboo. Yeah, I, I, I prepared another slide. I don't know if you read uh, uh, Lem Solaris, the novel. Yeah. Stanislav Lem Solaris. You, oh, you yes, yes, Solaris. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so if you remember, I, oh. I just put the, you know, the, I think it's very profound. Of course, there were two or three films that make it, you know, uh, sex or something, it is it's nothing to do with the or original. It is, there is life represented by the ocean. Yes. It has a consciousness. And so one aspect of that, it shows that there could be another form of life we are unable to, to imagine now, but can be completely different. Yeah. But also what you see when it's very pessimistic because they are, they are scientists, and, uh, and they cannot communicate. It's hopeless. They cannot understand. It's, it's impossible. The, it's not clear that the, the ocean understands the people, but probably yes, because it's, it creates some some ghost figures, if you if you remember. But the scientists are totally. They they don't have the tools, the, the mental, mm. the intellectual tools to understand uh, this type of life consciousness. And this could be the truth, because I think which we have, and it's good, of course, for us, but it, we have this opt optimism, this, this epistemological optimism that we can understand everything. And 
even even on the physics level, I remember when I was in Santa Barbara uh, 24 years ago. It was when the Maldacena uh, conjecture was. In, uh, it was a conjecture by a, a very young Argentinian physicist that the theory of everything will be when it will be proven that the final theory is a uh, a product of a conformal uh, field theory in a flat space, which was the end of. Einstein dream, I would say, multiply by an a anti de Sitter. And then I remember asking the one of the top stringers, Joe Polchinski, who unfortunately is no longer with us. And I asked, but let's imagine you're right. And this is the final theory. And then you get that there is described by an equation that you can mathematically prove this is unsolved. Is it possible? We said yes. So in what sense is going to be the final theory? So I think this, this is a warning about the possibility of other form of consciousness in life. And also, it's an argument, of course, it's a novel, but it's an argument about uh, this, this epistemological optimism that we understand everything will we can have, they might not be a theory of everything. It's, it's, it's already a miracle that, that physics is mathematical, as we know. I mean, Jean-Pierre, I, I, I really liked the Lesotho uncertainty principle, which says that until we understand the nature of life and the nature of the universe, we can't really begin to address these questions. And I, maybe I could just extend that a little bit to say, also until we understand the nature of consciousness. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Because, of course, of course. And the point is that I, I like your, your ocean analogy up there because uh, underlying the discussion of consciousness always seems to be a, the assumption that we are the only form of consciousness in the universe, that human beings, the consciousness generated by brains, that we are the culmination of complexity, and that this is really what the anthropic principle is about. And I find that really arrogant because it's, it's not only just, it's, to say that it's just to do with human beings is, is analogous to saying that consciousness is just to do to brains. Who is to say that within the universe there are not other levels of consciousness operating on vastly different scales, time scales and length scales, maybe much longer, much shorter, in which there is also consciousness? Uh, and, of course, we don't experience that, and so it's very easy for a reductionist physicist to say that the only level of consciousness in the universe is, is this form of consciousness we experience in our brains. But it's very arrogant. You know, it's saying that we are basically the, the culmination of, of, of complexity in the universe. Who's to say there aren't other forms of consciousness which maybe we, we'll tap into when we start contacting, um, you know, extra... extra galactic civilizations and things like that. And so I, I, and I think that before we can start talking about a, a proper th final theory of, of these fine tunings or, or anything else, we have to appreciate that we may have a very limited understanding of what consciousness is as well. But I think we're agreeing about that. What, what do you think? I would, because you, you put the quotation by Freeman Dyson that the universe knows about that. Do you think he had something like that in, in mind? Or? Well, I, I shouldn't get too deeply into the sort of philosophical issues of, of the nature of consciousness, but I personally feel that uh, the consciousness generated by our brain is only a very special form of consciousness. It's what I call consciousness with a little c. And I, and, and I don't see why there can't be sort of a hierarchy of levels of consciousness in the universe and this gets to sound very mystical and, and very theological, of course. But in principle, I can't see why there shouldn't be a high level of consciousness. You might, you know, one doesn't want to say something like cosmic level of consciousness because that gets you into trouble with physicists too. But when Freeman Dyson says the universe knew that we were coming, clearly he's not talking about consciousness with a little c. He's talking about consciousness with a big c. Yeah, okay. I, you know, it's... With Dyson, you never know because he had such a fantastic imagination that yes, you, yeah. you could. Yeah, I, I, I simply don't, don't, don't know where you, where this uh, quotation comes from. I, oh, 
I, I, I don't uh, recall reading I, uh, him, you know, being... I, being uh, I, I can uh, give you the source of the quote, but not yeah. later. Later. Sorry, we've talked too much. This is all out of your question, I'm, I'm afraid. We've talked for um, 20 minutes or so off from your one question, which is a bit... Uh, Self-indulgent, so we must ask yeah, other, other people. Yeah, maybe let's let's pass the microphone to another question. There was another question there. Sorry. Uh, sorry about my ignorance. Uh, my my question is this: um, We have now a new tool in the sky, uh, the James Webb Telescope, and I'm just wondering how much this will this new tool will influence uh, new theories and. Uh, Especially, I'm, I, I've just learned that about the, the, the earliest galaxies, the formation of earliest galaxies in the universe that, that kind of do not fit with our, our current understanding of the universe. Can you repeat yes, yes. I, I uh, yeah, I'll, I'll repeat the question. The question is about all the exciting information which is coming from the James Webb Telescope and, and how this throws light on, on these issues. So shall I go first, and then you can come in? Oh, the, the question is, what are the implications of all the exciting results coming from the James Webb Telescope? Oh, oh yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. Um, but the point is, cosmology in its own terms um, is, is always making fantastic progress, but of course there's all sorts of problems we don't understand, even in conventional cosmology, uh, as Jean... Yeah, so we, we, we have the problem of dark matter. We don't know what the dark matter is. We have the problem of the dark energy. We don't know what the dark energy is, although I said it was the it may well be a cosmological constant. Uh, there's the question of, of when galaxies formed and how galaxies formed. I'm fascinated in the question of the dark matter. And uh, Jean Pierre talked about Mond, you know, this theory which says there isn't dark matter, but it's a, we have to have a new model of, of gravity. What well, we don't know which of the theories is, is correct, whether it's dark matter or mond. I must say, in that respect, I rather like dark matter because I want the dark matter to be primordial black holes, which was the topic I talked about 50 years ago when I, we had the conference in Poland. So we all have biases, our prejudices, and uh, I like to think the dark matter is primordial black holes because if it isn't, I've wasted half, most, a lot of my life. But, but of course, it, it may be not that. It, it may be Mond. Who can tell? But the point I'm making is that the James Webb Telescope um, and all those similar projects, because there are lots of space telescopes and, and lots of observing programs, they're going to th throw and are throwing amazing uh, insights into these problems and hopefully will solve those problems. You're asking whether it's going to solve the problems associated with the fine-tuning, and that's a different issue. And I would say, uh, at the moment, I would say, it hasn't, I mean, it has thrown light on all sorts of cosmological problems. As far as I'm aware, it hasn't thrown light on any of the issues we've talked about in terms of the multiverse and the fine-tuning. I mean, there are conceivable signatures of the multiverse scenario. Like you might see hot spots in the microwave background sky and, and things like that. So it is conceivable that ordinary cosmological observations will provide information, but I don't think it's true at the moment that James Webb has produced any data which is directly relevant to this. I would say though, what's, when I look at the James Webb telescope results, it it's, it's the images are not only full of information, they're amazingly beautiful. You know, they're awesome. And you see these beautiful... We had a talk yesterday, yesterday in another session where talking about the links between poetry and, and science and between astronomy and, 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 and beauty, if you like. And to me, when you see the results from James Webb, it is actually awe-inspiring. And it makes you realize that really the, the result of the scientific journey isn't just information about your theory and measuring the parameters. It really is, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a growth of one's mind, essentially. And, it, and it, it's, it's, it's an aesthetic experience as well. 
So that's not, that's not the, related to the question as you intended it, I know, but to me, the result of scientific progress is not purely intellectual. It, it is, in some sense, itself. A, a, it it's, it's in, involves beauty and it involves some mind-like aspects as well. As, so anyway, that's, that's going on as, onto a tangent. No, I, think I, I think I may, maybe I should repay your compliment and ad advertise your research, speaking about the uh, James Webb Telescope, because it seems to show that they are very early in the evolution of those extremely massive black holes. And until recently, two years ago, most astrophysicists, cosmologists would say, no, it's the primordial black holes of this mass is absolutely impossible. But Bernard, who is probably the best specialist of primordial black hole, maybe not in the universe, but certainly on Earth, uh, uh, has written recently a very interesting article which shows that extremely massive black holes are possible and could be created. And this, uh, at the early ages, uh, the stages of the evolution of the universe, and this could discriminate in various inflation or inflation-like theories, uh, which is, since I was very critical about the inflation, the family, the very large family of inflation, but it doesn't mean that there are no ways of, of testing. So I, I know, a, I have a colleague at, at my institute who is a very well-known specialist of evolution of, of uh, black holes, and with this, uh, increasing numbers of increasingly massive black holes early in the age of the universe, I ask her one, so what do you think they come from? I said, you know, I begin to believe that they could be primordial. So this is also, but I'm, I'm saying that because 10 years ago she would just say, no, what, what, what do you mean? I mean, it's, it's a nonsense. Uh, well, thank you very much for drawing attention to that, Jean-Pierre. Yes, I mean, I have a, a, I'm even more passionate about primordial black holes than I am about the, the anthropic principle. So if you were to have asked me what are the implications of the James Webb Telescope observations for primordial black holes, I could have spoken for a whole hour because I think we could indeed have evidence ultimately for primordial black holes uh, from the James Webb Telescope, uh, among other, uh, uh, there are also other observations, gravitational wave of, observations as well. But that's just a different topic. But, uh, but to me, they are connected because these two topics I'm interested in, the primordial black holes and the anthropic principle, they were both for a long time regarded as, as low, low probability models. In other words, they weren't mainstream. But it's rather gratifying now that both of these topics are becoming quite popular. The anthropic principle is quite popular, that's what we've been talking about, and even primordial black holes are becoming quite popular as possible solutions to the dark matter problem. And uh, I have a personal interest in this because if primordial black holes don't exist, then I've, I've wasted quite a lot of my life. On the other hand, uh, if they do exist, then I know I played a little role in, 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 in with Stephen Hawking in some sense, I guess, starting the field. So it's, that's gratifying. So I like to think I've been interested in the anthropic principle and primordial black holes. If at least one of them turns out to be worthwhile, I'll be quite happy. And if both of them turn out to be quite worthwhile, I'll be doubly happy. Okay, do we have any more questions in the audience? Yeah, I see there. So sorry, we'll just wait for the microphone. Quite loudly. Uh, I do not believe that consciousness is only a feature associated with human beings. Uh, of course, uh, um, consciousness, and, but also intelligence, has different levels, also in different people. Uh, but also animals have to some degree, you know, consciousness. And it's very complicated, you know, uh, matter, how it, uh, how it is created, really. 
we believe that it is a matter of, of, of neural, you know, how many of these neurons, you know, are in a brain and so on. Some people believe this, is, this was given by God. <laughs> yes, of course. I mean, the, the, the question of whether there is consciousness of some form in, in other life forms uh, is, is something which is well studied. And, and uh, I mean, personally, I think it's quite clear that our dogs and cats have got some form of consciousness. And, and uh, the question is, how, how low down do you go in the, in the evolutionary tree before consciousness stops. And of course, there are some people, panpsychists, who believe consciousness is everywhere. So, and of course, I don't claim to know the answer to that. But when I was saying I think there could be a, a other levels of consciousness, I wasn't just referring to the level of uh, the rather, I suppose, conventional level of whether there is some form of consciousness in, in throughout the, the tree of life, if you like. I was thinking it, it, along somewhat more... Um, extended terms, there are physical structures on all sorts of different scales. I mean, in that Euroborus, we've got human beings at the bottom, but I mean, there's physical structures on, on a wide range of scales. There is complexity on a, a wide range of scales. Why are we so sure there isn't some form of consciousness associated with scales much bigger or much smaller? You remember Fred Hoyle wrote this book, The Black Cloud, which some people may remember, where you had some large some organism in space which was actually conscious, but it wasn't, of course, brain-based. And uh, you can even ask the question in terms of, of computers. You know, a big question at the moment, especially with all this emphasis on AI, is are computers going to become conscious? Well, we don't know the answer, and it's a very divided issue. Experts take very different views about the matter. But I, don't, I think it's very dangerous to say that computers will never develop consciousness because we have such a limited view of what consciousness is. I, when I talk about a hierarchy of consciousness, I'm also allowing for the possibility that there may be computers developing consciousness, but they may have consciousness on a very different, what I call specious present from us. Specious presence is the sort of minimum time scale of experience. I think that was the term Bergson used. And... and uh, and it may be that these different levels of consciousness have a very different specious presence. Our specious presence is about a tenth of a second, but it may be that computers have a specious presence of a nanosecond, and it may be there's some form of you know, galactic consciousness which operates on a specious presence of a million years. Who can tell? But I'm not, it sounds a bit mystical, but it's, I'm only, only talking in terms of physical systems. Because physical complex structures exist on a whole range of scales, all the way from nano, you know, computer scales, all the way maybe to galactic structures. So that's when I, when I talk about an extended consciousness, I was going beyond just the question of whether other life forms on this planet have consciousness. But thank you for that point. Yeah. Yes, Professor Lasota, do you have anything to, to add? The, the question regarded different levels of consciousness, even, uh, even among uh, earth, earthlings. So we, we, the, even, even some animals can, can have some degree of consciousness. And of course, you've, you've given the example of, of Lem's Solaris ocean planetary level consciousness. So do, do you have anything to add here? You know, I, I don't feel uh, <laughs> comfortable talking about consciousness because... Right. It's out of my uh, my domain, but I think that what, when we are talking about consciousness, we are in fact talking about soul, but we are avoiding the new word. And uh, because we try, if if we are in sci if being scientific, we try to not to create the duality between body and and soul and. Uh, uh, but in fact, uh, we don't really know what you are talking about. It's, it's, it's a very complicated uh, problem, and I recommend the essay by uh, Thomas Nagel, whom I uh, quoted several times, is what it is to be a bat. It's been translated to Polish, though, and uh, it's, I don't know, it's too, I, I like to think about it, but I like to talk about it because I... 
why why amateurs view uh, should be you know interested the fact that I'm a professor of physics that is I, I'm not this type I'm not famous enough who think that I'm some professor of physics and famous I can talk about everything you know and about artificial intelligence etc I can talk about natural stupidity yes but I may, may, may I just uh, uh, to illustrate it tell a small anecdote once more about Tom Nagel, he, when he was a young professor at Princeton, he was, uh, of course, went for an official dinner at the, at the, what in England is called the high table, and he was sat near to Kurt Gödel, the great magician mathematician. And he knew, of course, with Kurt Gödel, there could be no question of small talk. And he just read something about Kurt Gödel and said, Professor Gödel, I think that your concept of duality of body and soul creates problem with evolution. Kurt Gödel's brother, I don't believe in evolution. <laughs> well, uh, but of course, Jean-Pierre saying he, he's not qualified to talk about consciousness, nor am I. I mean, I'm not a professional philosopher, and I'm not a biologist or a psychologist, but but I, I can't resist trying to answer that. Maybe sometimes not being a professional in the field makes it easier to have um, to, to, to make answers because I think what you said about the soul was interesting because if you start talking about, I think one reason physicists are rather uncomfortable talking about consciousness is that once you start talking about consciousness, you're on the first, it's the first step of a slippery slope to soul and before long you're talking about soul and the word soul is even more taboo among physicists than the word consciousness. You know, physics and science is full of these taboo words. You've got the A word, which is the anthropic word, the C word, which is the consciousness word, there's the S word, which is the soul, there's the G word, which is God. So f physics, uh, maybe all academic disciplines, are full of all these taboo words. But what's interesting to me is that what is taboo changes with time. And so the A word was certainly taboo 50 years ago. I would say it's no longer taboo. I mean, that's perhaps why we've got a session on it here. It's, it's still controversial, but at least uh, mainstream physicists will talk about it. The C word is no longer taboo because we've got a big meeting on the physics of consciousness going on in Sicily right now. But I would say the S word, and the G words still are taboo, which is why I think maybe Jean-Pierre is wise to uh, <laughs> not say yeah. too much about it. But it, it depends on the nature of the audience. So I'm assuming the audience are philosophers and physicists. But maybe, maybe I will just add that, I mean, consciousness, of course, is very ambitious, but there is something less ambitious, but horribly ambitious, that this is what life is. Yes. Without or with con consciousness. And yeah. I, I just you know, showed it more detail because I, I knew all about it, especially I, I remember li being uh, listening to, uh, to Eugene Kunin and getting interested in the, mm. I, I didn't realize that, I thought that, you know, there's RNA word, uh, the, uh, the hypothesis, uh, I, I didn't realize how difficult it is because it's, there's this question of, uh, as Kunin says, egg and, uh, and hen, yeah. and the, something must have happened mm. that from something was no life and maybe it was proto-life because mm. some hypothesis is there was i don't know replication but not you know viruses are not mm. life because they they don't create proteins uh, they, they they have all they they are Okay, there, 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 there's also, yeah. uh, I think some people say this life, you know, it's not life, but uh, we don't know what life is. And of course you can imagine consciousness without life. Uh, yes, yes. You know, you're imagining, there are ideas even now here that you, to t transform, I mean, no, to translate or whatever it's called, a, a brain into, mm. into a computer. Yes. And then some, People say it's impossible. Some people say it's possible. They are, I'm afraid, they are going to try. And and then you have this computer, not artificial intelligence, but it's, mm. it's but real intelligence, but in a computer. And then is it life? It is certainly consciousness. 
it, it, I find that very interesting because I, I said I don't like the word anthropic principle, I like the word complexity principle, but you could also refer to a life principle. We don't know what's being selected for, and it, it yeah. could be life. And if you start saying, well, it's a life principle, that sounds a bit like vitalism, which may get you into trouble as well. But, but I agree that ultimately you have to understand that what the nature of life is before and the nature of consciousness. All of these things have to be understood uh -huh. before you can really have a proper understanding of, of, of these anthropic fine tunings. And I suppose one reason why we talk about the anthropic principle is at least people, anthropos is humans, and at least people think they know roughly what a human is. So we may not know what consciousness is, we may not know what life is, but we know what humans are, so it's quite convenient to be able to say this is a principle to do with humans. But I think that's a delusion. Yeah, so maybe uh, getting back to the anthropic principle. Uh, so I, I it, People, uh, I mean, one one of the um, criticism, not of, of the name, maybe only of the name anthropic principle, but also uh, of the principle as such, is that, well, first of all, it doesn't require humans, because one can argue that all the predictions made by the use of the anthropic reasoning, the famous prediction by Hoyle and the prediction of the value of the cosmological constant by Weinberg, will be equally, equally well uh, put forward if we wanted to, if we simply, simply by the observation that we have carbon in the universe. So we, we could say it's not an anthropic principle, but a carbon principle, right? Thanks. So uh, I, I wonder if it's, if it's not just a big misnomer to, to talk about anthropic principle, but if it's methodologically sound even to invoke consciousness um, when talking about the anthropic reasoning. We, all, all we know is, okay, we observe that there is carbon, so of course there had to exist this resonance in the, in the triple alpha process, right? So I, I guess what I, wanted to, what I wanted to point out is the distinction between the anthropic reasoning, mm. the one that, is, that has been really successfully used in science, and the phenomenon of consciousness. Right, there are two separate things. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, and, and that, is, that is so important because, in fact, the arguments I quoted and the ones that Brandon gave and the ones that I gave in the article with Martin, they're all to do with the existence of stars and galaxies and chemistry and things like that. But they were nothing specific to do with humans at all. I mean, it could just as well have been a condition required for television sets. Okay. And so from that point of view, that's, and that's precisely why even Brandon said the anthropic principle was a bad term. It's nothing to do with humans. That's why I said I like the word complexity, but I mean, that's a, a bit vague as well. Um, but nevertheless, at the end of the day, you do have to ask the question, well, what is the anthropic, what, is the, what are these fine tunings selecting for? And... And that's where opinions will differ, because, of course, we don't know. I think I show a, a slide where I said, well, even if we think it's to do with observers, and that was the original idea, that it's to do with observers, what counts as an observer? You know, is it a professor of mathematics, or, or is it going to be a mouse, or is it going to be a computer? I mean, where do you draw the line? Uh, and nobody knows the answer. I have to say that, for me, the emphasis on observer is ultimately important. It's the presence of observers. And because you, if you think of observers as being to do with consciousness and life, then you're, you're drawn in that direction. But it wouldn't have to be. And for example, I mean, Smolin has a, an interpretation of the anthropic tunings, which has nothing to do with consciousness. He says it's because you produce black holes. And if you, if you form a black hole, it forms a baby universe and that in the new universe, the, the constants are sort of mutated. So he has a scenario where the universe is, is basically optimal for creating black holes. And, and so that's a version of the fine-tuning, which has nothing to do with the, uh, the consciousness at all. So you're quite right. There are different interpretations. And the reason I personally have gone in the direction of saying, well, I think it is something to do with consciousness, 
And that's really only because I am also fascinating consciousness, and I think consciousness is, is also fundamental, because I have this independent, I've had that, I'm independently interested in that issue. But in principle, you're quite right. It doesn't have to relate to consciousness. Yeah, it's, in fact, if you look at uh, what uh, Steve Weinberg did, in fact, he was really interested in the value of the cosmological constant. And so he used the anthropic principle, but this was anthropic, it was the galactic principle. He said if the, the value uh, was uh, much smaller, then the galaxy would not form. And then there was this principle of mediocrity that was we have it mentioned that, that when you get a value of something, it cannot be the, the extremal value, it might be somewhere in, 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 in the middle. It, it cannot be, so which, yeah. which is, uh, I don't know, <laughs> the name is very funny, principle of mediocrity. And, but uh, it's also, a, why should be in principle? And I think the anthropic principle also has a, it's another misnomer. Why, why should it be a principle? I think it's at a, best it's an anthropic yeah, hypothesis. Yeah. Why is principle? Well, I mean, the Copernican principle is yeah. a principle, but the cosmological principle is a principle. But this is a hypothesis. Or a, or a heuristic. Yeah. A, a heuristic. And also, I want to stress that a lot of these other advocates of the multiverse, like Weinberg, are not, you know, they're not so keen to associate with consciousness necessarily. Yeah, yeah. nothing to do with consciousness. Yeah. They, they were keen on it because they didn't have to invoke God, because a lot of these people who are keen advocates of the multiverse are atheists. You know, they want to do away with God, and, and that's... <laughs> Maybe someone disapproves, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> what a coincidence. Okay, so there was an, another question here. I have a little following question. So why stop at life and consciousness? For example, what about sport sens sensational cases like Poland won Soviet Union in ice hockey in 1966, a championship in Katowice. It is fine. Tuned, tuned, uh, tuned uh, case or not? So where we should stop? Because you know, I, it, it seems to me that this is an old problem of determinism and indeterminism, which is complicated by introducing this idea of uh, fine tuning or anthropic principle and so on. It is only a new language for old problem. So we, we, we met today because the universe was so fine tuned or not. You know, where we should uh, stop the, the, this analysis? Uh, perhaps life arose as an accidental event, even improbably, that's it. Well, I must say, I've, I've never been asked to, to link the anthropic principle to uh, s sports before, which is, uh, so I, I'm, I'm talking off the top of my head, and that's a, an interesting idea. I mean, I suppose it all comes down to the question of teleology. I mean, if, if you, th do you think the anthropic principle is teleological, that there is a purpose and, and that's pe people like me don't normally connect it. We try and get away with, get away from the idea that it's something theological. Now, clearly, the fact that we're meeting today at this meeting, uh, I would say that doesn't require any teleology, because I would say that uh, to say that the universe was created with all these fine tunings, so that we should meet today. I would obviously not take that as a very good argument, or, or so that a certain team should win the, uh, the football World Cup or something. I, I, I would not see that as a good argument, because I, I would say that the point about the multiverse is that it's a bit like the lottery, you know. If, if with a lottery, a, a, you buy a lottery ticket and you, you win a billion dollars, a million dollars, 
and you think, well, this is a miracle. But it isn't a miracle because we know that a million people bought lottery tickets and someone's got to win. And that's the same argument with the multiverse, that you're saying that it seems a miracle that we're in this universe, but actually, if there are a million universes, it's inevitable that such a universe exists and we'll be in it. Now, likewise, when we meet, I would say it's inevitable with eight billion people in the world that <clears throat> people are constantly going to be meeting each other and having miraculous conversations which seem to have required fine tuning. But I would say that that's actually a result, it's like the lottery ticket, with so many billions of people in the world having so many meetings, two people like us are bound to have a meeting and have an interesting conversation. And that, that doesn't actually have any implications in terms of physics. It's just a result of the fact of the fact that there are lots of people around. So ironically, I would turn your question the other way around, and I would say that your question, if anything, is why the multiverse makes it natural to have these tunings. It's analogous to have natural for, for us to have a meeting. So I don't know. I'd rather turn your question around from what you originally intended, but I don't know if how that strikes you. So I, I'm saying it's it, I'm saying it's not purposive. You're not putting in a purpose uh, for these fine tunings if you invoke the multiverse. Just as I'm not putting in a purpose in saying that you and I are meeting today, it's just the result of contingency. But I, that's my best I can come up with. But thank you for the interesting question. I don't. I, I, well, sorry, I, 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 don't I, I don't know if you would you. Uh, would, I, I didn't. I, I, from the question, I, I think I've heard only where to stop, right? Uh, y yes, so just I think at the beginning. I yes, it's only if you wanted to ask. So the question about the links with sports and things like that. No, the, I mean, I mean, okay. Maybe I can I can try to paraphrase the question. The question is, uh, how far should we go with this anthropic reasoning? If we, because if we start to use the anthropic reasoning, like everywhere, we can even use it to uh, to answering the question why Poland won with Soviet Union in in the 60s in the ice hockey, which is of course not very not very serious argument. Uh, so where's the, where are the limits of the application of the anthropic principle be, because before it gets ridiculous? I guess that was the intent. No, I, I, I think I said what I think about the anthropic principle. Right? Mm. My talk was about it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. My, yes. my well, advice is forget about it. OK. OK. So I have no, Nothing it, to add. I think it, it plays a role. It played a role. It was, uh, sorry, it, play, it, it played a Positive and negative, but I think it, yeah, it uh, I think encourages some type of think, thinking, and uh, but I think now it's, it's it became stellar. It's uh, you know especially that I got myself believing that this discovery when they realized to calculate in some version of the string theory they are ten to the five hundred vacua that is. This is a sort of a revolution, and it means that there are infinite number of universes. But only talking to uh, recently, even to to Malcolm Perry and Najetkov, I I realize it is not true. It is just you know a big extension of something. Because first of all, as I said, it is not a theory of everything. It probably cannot be. On the other hand, since we don't know. We know nothing about compactification. We don't know. It could be only one universe. But if you read most of the literature of stringers, of a lecture, I even consulted lectures preparing this my, 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 my talk. You have this, yeah, this completely changed. Even George Ellis, who is an adversary, who there's, I, I recommend an excellent discussion in Nature, I think, between Bernard and, and George years ago. It's, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's really. Fantastic as a, yeah. as a uh, introduction, in a sense, conclusion to mm. the to the problem. But even George later, when he he said he he, uh, he mentions this this uh, hypothesis of of, of Ken, uh, Perry and Zhitkov that there could be one solution, but said now that they uh, discovered this 10, uh, 10 to the five hundred uh, vacua, uh, the things go to other way. It's not true. Mm. 
maybe they yeah. could, but mm -hmm. since we don't know, I mean, they don't know, I also don't know, how to compactify this organization, uh, it means nothing. Mm. Especially it's not even a theory mm. of, of, of space-time, so well, what are we talking about? Uh, yes, I do think the, the, the string landscape argument that a 10 to the 500 um, possible universe is, is very suspect, and I agree with uh, Zitkoff and Perry in, in, in that regard. But I would still say, if the final theory determined the constants uniquely, it would still be a mystery why those constants are the ones required for no, life. I, I agree. But, and, but and, by, and by the way, as regards to your question, I mean, I think it is an important question because um, at first I was a bit shocked by it and thought you were joking. But once you ask the question, what are we fine-tuning for? Are we, are we fine-tuning for um, consciousness or black holes? Or are we fine-tuning for professors of mathematics or for mice? You know, you could say, are we fine-tuning for who's going to win the, the football? I mean, it's just a, a question of where do you draw the line between what is a, a reasonable thing you're fine-tuning for? I would say it's not reasonable to say the universe is fine-tuned for who's going to win the World Cup at football. But on the other hand, it's a, it's a continual gradation, you know. Who's to say what the fine-tuning is for? And I think, really, that is what your question is. What is what range of selection effects should you be allowing? <clears throat> but anyway, that's a, a stop at that point. Yes. Maybe I add something. I th think there is an implicit, usually necessity interpretive principle that life in the in the universe, even in the galaxy, is rare. If we find that almost every planet that that is in the in the habitable zone has a life, not even a civilization. So if, if, if there are zillions of of uh, uh, planets in the uni in, in, in the galaxy in the universe that where life is, then I think that there's nothing special about life. It's it's just it's 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 a uh, Brandon made made a, I remember he he thought about it made with point. He said he even. Even one of the argument was that life appeared on air late, comparatively. That so it is it also, also um, Eugen Kunin uh, said that the test of his hypothesis is that he found many uh, examples of life in the galaxy. Then of course his hypothesis is uh, mm. uh, will be will be falsified. That's such an important point because the fact that the universe is fine tuned for life does not mean that life is, is prevalent everywhere. And in fact, as Br Brandon himself argued, and I think you're just pointing this out, Brandon himself later argued that life is probably unique to Earth in this universe, mm. which is a rather strange argument. I can, I can give it to you in a very short time. Brandon says there is some, you see, the great coincidence is that our Earth is four and a half billion years old. And the time scale for, for life self-replicating cells to arise was also about <coughs> uh, the same time scale. Now, Brandon says that's an amazing coincidence. Why should these time scales, the time scale for the evolution of life, be comparable to the time scale of the age of the Earth? And his argument was, let's assume that there is some time scale for, for life to evolve. That time scale, it's unlikely to be the actual age of the Earth, but it could be, if it was much less than the age of the Earth, then life should be everywhere throughout the galaxy, but we know that's not the case. Therefore, he says, chances are that the time, lifetime for, time for life to evolve is much longer than the age of the universe, which is, I think, what your, your biological person was saying, but that's all right if we live in an infinite universe, not necessarily a multiverse, but in a, a universe that extends forever, uh, there's bound to be somewhere where life has evolved much more quickly than you would expect, just by chance. So Brandon's conclusion is that life is probably unique in our universe, uh, and the, which is really odd, and it goes completely what, against what you might would have thought was the original anthropic argument. But this is just elaborating, really, on the point Jean-Pierre was making.
that we could be unique even if you believe in the anthropic fine tunings. Well, that's at least falsifiable because if we find life somewhere over there, even a microbial life, it would be, let's say, a falsification of this of this conclusion. It would be the it would be falsification of that argument, but not of the anthropic of fine tuning course. argument. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm sorry to to say that, but our time scale right. has already reached its end. So this concludes our our session on anthropic principle. I'm well. I have one final question that I will. Of course, not uh, not know the answer to. I wonder where will anthropic principle and physics and cosmology in general be in the next 50 years? Mm, but that's that we'll learn only when we meet in the 600th anniversary of Nicolas Copernicus. I hope well, we'll organize another conference at that time. Maybe I'll be still around. I hope all of us will be. <laughs> but that's uh, that's the end of our discussion for today. So thank you once again, and thank you for the audience. <laughs>